Thank you. Thank you. The next item of business. The, the next item of business is a debate on a statement by the First Minister. Members who wish to take part in the debate should press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Kezia Dugdale uh, to speak. Ms Dugdale, 18 minutes. Thank you, President Officer, and can I thank the First Minister for advance sight of that speech. I expect she remembers what it's like to be leading your party from the opposition benches. Indeed, I remember as a student watching her opposite a Labour First Minister debating the programme for government back in 2006. It is a privilege to be here. It is a privilege to serve, and it is a privilege that I will never take for granted. So I promise the First Minister and her government this, where the government shares our ambition for the people of Scotland, where the government shares our determination that where you come from matters less than where you want to go, where the station that you were born into matters less than the talents that you have, and where the government recognises its responsibility to nurture talent, to support aspiration, and help those selves who find themselves in need, the Labour Party is ready and willing to stand with you. Where the government lacks ambition or shows timidity and where it fails to meet the aspiration of a new generation, then you will find us equal to the task of opposition. The Scottish Labour Party that I lead won't exist to face off SNP ministers here in the chamber, but will rather turn and face the country. We will work for a Scotland where everyone gets the opportunity to unlock their talents to know the dignity and satisfaction of work, for an environment protected for all and enjoyed by all, for a dynamic economy where entrepreneurs are supported to create the jobs, opportunities and wealth that Scotland needs to thrive. The First Minister has placed educational inequality at the heart of her statement today, and I welcome that. She knows I am passionate about ensuring that every child gets a fair chance in life. The First Minister has asked us to look at her government's record she says it is a strong foundation for the future. But if we look at those children in their final year of primary school who have spent every day of their school years under this government, we do not see a record to be proud of. 93% of those children in primary seven who come from the least deprived backgrounds are performing well at reading. That's compared to just 81% from the most deprived backgrounds, a 12% gap in reading. When it comes to writing, it's 77% from the least deprived, compared to just 56 of the most deprived. That's a 21% gap in writing. And with numeracy, it's 77% of kids from the least deprived areas reaching the appropriate levels, compared to just 53% of the most deprived. That's a 24% gap in numeracy between the richest and poorest pupils. Almost half of the poorest kids leaving primary school are unable to write properly or to count properly. That should shame us as a nation. We in this chamber are responsible not just for caring for these children during the hours they are at school, but for preparing them for the opportunities of the years to come. And by any measure, we are failing them. I started the day this morning by joining the breakfast club at the Royal High Primary School here in Edinburgh, for 30 pence, you can have some toast and juice and start the day well. But the council here in Edinburgh is under increasing financial pressure and is faced with the choice of either scrapping that breakfast club or charging £2 a day to meet its costs. That's a Labour and SNP council, so the First Minister and I both share the responsibility for keeping that breakfast club open. In fact, we both share the desire to see tackling educational inequality as the number one priority. And after months of debating inequality in this chamber, we can now see real action. That's great. We have seen money invested in education advisors. Let's see money invested now in the teachers who are working with those pupils who face the biggest barriers to educational achievement. We know who they are and where they work. We know so many of those teachers already defy the odds daily and help their pupils to shine. We can reward those teachers. We can give them more classroom assistance. We can bring in a new enhanced teacher grade to raise the skills and rewards of those teaching in the most challenging classrooms. The SNP have led the way on this already with a programme for head teachers. They can do it again, should they wish for teachers on the front line to have the same support. There is so much more that we can do now. We can recognise that to improve literacy amongst children, we have to improve literacy for mums and dads and primary carers. We can scrap fees for exam appeals so that all young people who want it can get a fresh look at their grades. 
and we should move mountains to help look after children, for these are our kids and their future lies in our hands. We can take a fresh look at school inspections. Today, 90% of schools are inspected as satisfactory or better. But satisfactory means that the strengths only just outweigh the weaknesses. That is why I believe the First Minister should immediately suspend all school inspections for one year and use the time to redesign the inspection regime. I would like to see more unannounced inspections, and those inspections must be used to drive excellence for all. No parent wants a satisfactory education for their child. They want the best possible education for their child, and it's my mission to ensure they have the best possible start in life. No, thank you. Uh, after educational inequality, the inequality between the genders should be the top of the First Minister's list for the year ahead. And much has been said over the summer about how having three female leaders in this chamber is good for Scotland. And I agree. But it's not enough for us to just stand here. I feel a greater responsibility than I ever have before to deliver material change and equality for women as I lead my party. So we welcome the moves to introduce an offence for revenge porn and hope that we will quickly follow the rest of the UK where individuals are already being convicted of this offence. Putting into the public domain material of the most private and personal nature, it's not simply an abuse of trust. It leaves the victims feeling humiliated and ashamed. And I believe there is more we can do to protect women from other forms of domestic abuse and sexual assault. So I welcome the bill announced today. The number of rapes reported to the police has increased over the past year, and a fifth of those report being raped whilst asleep. We need to do more, not just to tackle these crimes, but to tackle the culture that means that these offences still persist in a modern Scotland. I would urge her in the year ahead to give proper consideration to how we use the education system to teach young men and young women about sexual consent. Today, a young woman, no matter how, how hard she works, will experience institutionalised barriers in her way to success. For some young, young women, it will not matter how hard they work. They won't make it unless government eradicates the injustices in her way. It is our duty in this chamber to break down those barriers. Whether it is access to science and technology skills, whether it's tackling the gendered violence that one in four women will face, the culture of low paid work, low-skilled and part-time work, or the motherhood penalty where women lose positions or promotions for going on maternity leave. Having women leaders talking about these issues is a start, but it's only a start because we will be known by our deeds, not just our words. I welcome her focus on growing the economy and the recognition that the strategy set out last year needed more detail and a plan for implementation. The single most important issue that we can get right is childcare. And I believe we have a consensus across this chamber now that childcare isn't just a social policy, it's a hard-nosed economic policy, striking right at the heart of labour market participation. And together, we accept that high quality, affordable, accessible childcare can transform the lives and open up opportunities. And as in previous years, the First Minister has today spoken out about increasing the number of hours available. But she'll know that the McLean Commission on Child Care made clear this summer that what matters isn't just the hours available, it is that they are affordable and accessible to working parents. That same report highlighted the fact that we spend as much on child care here in Scotland as they do in Denmark and Sweden, but we get nothing like the return for our money. So I would urge her to use the year ahead to take a fresh look at her approach to child care and ensure that the policy is designed to fit around parents' lives rather than to fit into an election leaflet. Any economic plan also has to recognise the problems faced in our oil industry. The problems around jobs and the sustained low oil price haven't gone away. And in response to this some months ago, the First Minister launched an apprenticeship scheme. But since then, only 12 people have been helped by this scheme to a backdrop of thousands of jobs lost. In the medium term, we need to find and support action in the industry. In the long term, we need a serious national effort to prepare for a post-oil economy and to take advantage of the economic opportunities of decommissioning, which will otherwise go to other parts of the UK and across Europe. 
And we have to recognise that a serious economic plan needs analysis and that data that we can trust is free from political interference. So whilst we welcome the Scottish Fiscal Commission Bill, we renew again today our call for an independent fiscal watchdog. <laughs> Growing our economy means improving productivity. We can only achieve that with investment in skills. Sure. First Minister. I wonder what uh, functions Casey Dardell believes the Fiscal Commission will be undertaking if it is not undertaking independent scrutiny of the financial actions and projections of the government. Absolutely no one Ms. has Dugdale. been impressed by with the plans that this government has put forward for a Fiscal Commission. What they want is independent knowledge and advice that they can rely on. Officer, I was going on to the issue of productivity and we can only achieve that with investment in skills, giving everyone a chance to change their lives and to have the opportunity of a second chance. This government have cut colleges to pay for universities. So the solution can't be now to cut universities or schools to invest in colleges. We need a real debate about why it is that we view education as less of a spending priority in this country. And I'll turn to this in detail in a second. But I want to say something about the Tory government's trade union bill. None of us in this Scottish Parliament should be any in doubt about the intentions behind this bill. This Tory bill, supported by Ruth Davidson, has one intention and one intention only, and that is to undermine the rights and ability of working people to organise for better wages, terms and conditions in the workplace. The withdrawal of a person's labour is the most basic right that working people have, and its effective use over time has resulted in better wages, better health and safety standards, better pensions, and as a result, better public services and a better society. This ideologically driven bill is an attack on these hard-won rights, and it must be resisted. It must be stopped. And as such... And as such, on behalf of my party, I want to make clear to the Scottish Government they will have our full support to do everything we can to stop this bill. Over the summer, I heard Rosanna Cunningham say it's the prerogative of Scottish ministers to decide on issues like check-off and facility time. She's right. The Tories' arguments against check-off and facility time are rooted in logistics, practicalities and costs. They are issues of public administration, not industrial relations, and are therefore clearly devolved. So the government will have our full support in saying no to the trade union bill. Likewise, the government would have our support for demanding a legislative consent motion. That way, the Tories would need, need approval from this parliament to act, approval that they're not going to get from these benches. We don't just want to support this government's rhetoric on the trade union bill. We want to support some real action now to stop this bill. Today, as always, the case when the government sets out its programme for the year, we have seen many eye-catching and very worthy announcements like the ones on the EMA, which in reality just reinstate a cut this SNP government made a few years ago. And on issues like uh, kinship care, they were promised a long, long time ago by this government, and now they're delivering on it. I am delighted, however, to see the announcement around MND and communications aids for people who suffer from MND, and I'm delighted that Gordon Aikman is in the gallery today to hear that announcement. The First Minister and I both visited the Anne Rowling Centre last week. In fact, we both donated our voices to the nation as if people hadn't heard enough from us already. But I'm sure she will have been persuaded and just blown away by the incredible technological advances at the Anne Rowling Centre. Through the science and innovation of academics in our universities here in the UK, we can now give people their voice back. When you take that breathtaking innovation and combine it with the beauty of our NHS, wonderful things are happening for people in the most incredible circumstances, and that must be welcomed. Likewise, I welcome the announcement today around the burial and cremation bill, which will bring a sense of peace and justice to those families affected by what happened at Morton Hall, many of which I know well and have worked with over the past few years of this parliamentary session. I know that issue goes beyond Edinburgh and will be welcomed across the country. Can I also welcome the Private Tenancies Bill? The First Minister knows we've been arguing for action to control rent rises for months. 
Indeed, we tried to amend the First Minister's last housing bill to this end, and she voted against that several times. It is great that we finally see action on this, but whilst the government have prevaricated, rents have risen again. And had this SNP government acted in 2013, when its last private sector review took place, the average Scottish renter in the private sector would have saved £150 a year already. So this is slow progress. But what overrides all these individual spending announcements is the overall balance of spending in Scotland. It was Joe Biden that said, don't tell me what you value, show me your budget and I'll tell you what you value. Scotland currently has public spending which is £1,300 higher per person than the UK average. How successive budgets have chosen to invest in this money reveals our real national priorities. Today, the First Minister again says that education and health are priorities. But her government's budgets have told a very different story. When the Labour government established this parliament, we spent a higher proportion of our budget on health and education than England. Today, we spend a smaller proportion of our budget on these priorities than England. Points well made in the editorial of the Financial Times today. At the start of devolution, spending on health was 16.5% higher than the UK average. Today, we spend just 6.5% more on health than the rest of the UK. Sure. I wonder if she would care to comment on these statistics. The share of the Scottish Government budget taken up by health in 2006-07 was 37.4%. Today it's 41.2%. Care to comment? The facts stand for themselves, Prior <laughs> President Officer. No, they do. No, they do. Let me give her another one. Let me give her another one. Education, too, has become less of a priority over successive budgets. In 1999, and I'm happy to put these figures in spice, Order. immediately after today's debate, in 1999, we spent £204 more per person than the UK average on education. Today, that has fallen to £18. These budget decisions reflect huge issues about the future of our country, so we are disappointed to see the budget process truncated. In closing, presiding officer, this First Minister is the most powerful person who has ever sat in that chair. Not only does she have a majority in this Parliament, she has swept aside her opponents in our other Parliament. She has more powers than ever before, and more are coming. Her party and her supporters dominate so many aspects of Scottish public life. So I say to her today, you have the power, and if you have the political will, you have the money. If you have the courage to take the radical action we need, if you have the courage to take the radical action we need to reform and to redistribute resources, you will have our support. It is time that all of us raised our ambitions for our country, for our politics, and for ourselves. Last week, the Lib Dems and the Conservatives committed to using the new tax powers to ensure lower taxes, and they will have to set out what that would mean in terms of cuts. The other parties in this chamber will have to set out our priorities too. I welcome this because it shows that Scottish politics is moving from a debate about what we can't do to talking about what we can do, what we will do. We are not powerless to act. Nothing is inevitable. We are the masters, or in this chamber, the, mistr the mistresses of our own destiny. So let's build that fairer and more equal country together. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Ruth Davidson. Eight minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Let me start first by thanking the First Minister for early sight of our speech, and may I welcome her uh, and all MSPs back to the Chamber after the summer break. Of course, Scottish politics didn't stop in this Parliament's absence. Indeed, it seems almost to have gathered pace. As the First Minister pointed out, the Scotland Bill is being pushed through Westminster, and I'm pleased that the new tax and welfare powers upon which we all support are, are being devolved, are being advanced in line with the agreed timetable. I also will put on record my wholehearted backing for the introduction of a new living wage of £9 an hour across the United Kingdom, as announced by the Chancellor in his summer budget. No doubt the admission of the, I'm in my first minute, uh, of a welcome in the First Minister's speech was simply accidental. We in this Parliament must turn our attention, however, to the powers over which we exercise full control, from the education of our children, 
to the laws under which our justice system is run, to the state of our National Health Service. These powers are huge in scope. And over the next year, this must become the clear centre of our politics in Scotland. In short, it's time that this government focused 100% on the day job. So let me start with the part of today's statements which we welcome on issues such as the baby ashes scandal and domestic abuse, both of which I have raised repeatedly in this chamber, we see welcome forward movement which will have Scottish Conservative support. I'm pleased to see that our repeated and sustained calls for standardised assessments to be introduced in schools has been heeded. It is a massive U-turn, but a welcome one. It is simply wrong that parents across Scotland can see their child go all the way through primary school and halfway into high school without having any independent measure of how well they are doing. This failure of critical assessment cannot continue. We need to change and we need to go further still. This SNP government has already withdrawn Scotland from two international tests on literacy and maths. The First Minister has said, and I quote, we need reliable data to inform policy, and I agree. That's why she should pull another U-turn and re-enter those international tests too. We need to measure ourselves against the rest of the world so our children have the very best chance of success. Now, the First Minister has already made it clear that she wants her administration to be judged on its educational record. I only wish that this single-minded purpose had come about a little earlier than eight long years after the SNP took sole control of the Scottish Government. Because this is a government which has presided over a fall in literacy standards, a government which between 2010 and 2013 has overseen a real terms cut in education funding of 5%, a government which has cut college places by 140,000 at the altar of a university tuition fee policy which favours the better off. So while we will take time on these benches to assess the ideas put forward by the First Minister in her statement this afternoon, we will do so with no little scepticism that this eight-year-old government has the ideas and focus necessary to do the job. We will also propose a better alternative. As we see families continuing to move house to secure the golden ticket of a good catchment area, we will press the Scottish Government to free up head teachers to innovate so that every local school is one you want to live near. There is nothing stopping schools in deprived areas, becoming beacons of excellence. And it begins with giving teachers, head teachers and communities the power to do it. In the meantime, it is clear that we need a renewed focus on reading and writing by ensuring that teacher training institutions prioritise literacy training. It is astonishing that some courses are allocating just 20 hours out of a four-year course to literacy teaching. This needs genuine change. We also need to ensure that schools work with parents so that reading is at the centre of both school life and of family life. If we turn to the government's other legislative priorities, this party's view is that we continue to see a worrying trend towards centralisation and political control freakery. The government higher education bill already in progress is quite simply an attack on academic freedom. It will enforce political control on academic institutions whose reputations have been built precisely because of their political independence. Quite why the SNP has decided to fight the very institutions which deliver massive added value to Scotland is beyond me. And the First Minister today, I ask her to reconsider those plans. Similarly, we will contest this government's land reform bill as it is another move towards a liberal and centralising government. And we will campaign for a genuine fix for our failing police service. Armed officers stop and search the M9 tragedy. Police Scotland is struggling. And now, just two years after creating it, this SNP government is forced to concede today that it needs reform. The creation of a few new committees simply won't cut it. We need local accountability restored to a service which to much of the country now feels utterly remote. And if we turn to health, this party will support, we will support all moves to ensure that the NHS is properly funded. 
But it is also time to accept that money alone will not solve the NHS's problems. Doctors and nurses are telling us that politically driven targets are now hampering their attempts to provide patient care. We must listen to them before more nurses and doctors decide to leave NHS Scotland and pursue their careers elsewhere. And we also need some clarity of thinking. We need to free up more money to recruit more nurses. And if that means that the better off, like those of us here in this chamber, should pay a contribution for our prescriptions, then so be it. And as we prepare, as we prepare for more powers being devolved to this parliament, I welcome the fact that the First Minister has turned her attention to the substantial welfare powers she will soon be responsible for. But I would like to know how developed those preparations are. The First Minister used her speech to unjustly, in my view, attack the current work programme, which is the largest welfare-to-work programme in our nation's history, and is a programme which, in point of fact, has helped 38,510 long-term unemployed Scots. That's those who are furthest from the job market back into a long-term job. She says that she is working on a replacement. And what evidence can she provide to show us that her replacement will actually be ready by April 2017? For our part, my own party will promote our own proposals on welfare over the coming months. Our guiding principle will be to ensure that the welfare system helps people back into work. And in that, we will be helped by the sound economic foundations provided by the UK, which, since we came into government in 2010, has seen unemployment uh, has seen employment rise in Scotland by 174,000 and unemployment fall by 64,000. That shows just one benefit of our continued membership of the United Kingdom, the fastest growing economy of the G7 last year. And over the next year, I will ensure that this party stays committed to what I believe are the priorities of most Scots. Speaking up, for those of us who want to see Scotland thrive within the United Kingdom, standing up for family finances which face ever greater pressure from the cost of living, and insisting that huge powers that this Parliament has are used to ensure that we have better schools, a secure NHS and an enterprise culture which makes us the best place to do business in Western Europe. It is time for a Scottish alternative to the SNP and we are determined to provide it. Many thanks. I now call on Willie Rennie. Six minutes, please, Mr Rennie. Thank you. Order. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, since we last met in this chamber, the Chairman of the Scottish Police Authority has resigned, the Chief Constable of Police Scotland has resigned, and we witnessed the unfolding terrible aftermath of the tragic incident on the M9 motorway. A police officer told the BBC last week, Police Scotland is on its knees. I know this to be true from almost daily contact from police officers and civilian staff. They cite low morale, and serious problems such as backfilling of civilian jobs by experienced but inappropriately trained police officers, excessive waiting times in call centres and control rooms, industrial scale stop and search, top down targets and controls, and more near misses because of errors at Bilston Glen. The list goes on. One told me just yesterday that the reforms being put through by this government are putting police and public in danger. Yet, yet the Justice Secretary still thinks it's appropriate to praise the soon-to-depart Chief Constable and tells us he will leave a lasting positive legacy. And in this document, this document published today, only today, the First Minister's programme says this, the successful transition to the new single police service on the 1st of April 2013 has placed Scotland at the forefront of UK policing. I warned ministers before about the dangers of their plans, and I am warning them now 
that what they have announced today is simply not enough. This government is denying reality. The reality is that Police Scotland is not at the forefront of UK policing. It is on its knees. We need an independent inquiry into the operations of Police Scotland. It needs to change before it gets any worse. We have also put forward proposals to reform the democratic architecture of the Scottish Police Authority and Police Scotland. As part of her review today of accountability and scrutiny, if she is prepared to listen this time, I will take her through our plans. They are reasonable and pragmatic and will inject local accountability back into the police. The code of conduct on stop and search is a step in the right direction. But all stop and search must be put on a statutory footing to bring an end to the industrial use of stop and search. But the review of police as a whole is essential to restore the morale of staff and officers and confidence of the public. We've got other proposals too, combining economic discipline with social justice. We want to create opportunity for everyone, no matter what their background. A pupil premium to help children who need a helping hand at school. It targets financial support to individual children across Scotland, not just in limited councils, to provide support for extra tuition and resources. It's that personalised support that makes the difference to inequality. An expansion of nursery education and childcare the best educational investment we could make. Last month, 15,000 two-year-olds skipped through the doors of their nursery for the first time. But only, only after these benches pressed the Scottish Government to deliver this. That figure should be doubled. In England, the support is outstripping that available in Scotland, and that needs to change. A recruitment plan for GPs. Our survey of GPs in the summer found that one in three would not choose that career now if they had an opportunity to revisit the decision. So many are retiring early, going part-time, or potential new recruits are going elsewhere. Of the GPs who knew about the government's plan, 99% thought it was inadequate. The Royal College of GPs have a blueprint. The government should take it seriously. And parity for mental health treatment. One in four of us will have a mental health condition in our lifetime. But the treatment options are inadequate and involve long waits. Yesterday, I visited Urban Therapy in Cross Hill in Fife. They are overwhelmed by people seeking counselling from as far afield as Glasgow. We all need parity for that service. On pupil testing and league tables, the document published today says this. The clear purpose of this reporting and use of assessment data is to drive accountability throughout the Scottish education system. That includes school level data that will lead to teaching to the test and every child put under unacceptable pressure to make the numbers look good. Despite what the First Minister says, it is clear that the return, we are returning to the kind of testing and tables the previous Liberal Democrat Labour administration abolished. Nicola Sturgeon has been in government for over eight years. The problems with the police, the NHS and schools are not just problems for which she is a passive observer. This parliament has been responsible for over 15 years. Nicola Sturgeon has been responsible for over eight years, and Nicola Sturgeon is responsible now. She mentions the future repeatedly in her speech. Perhaps the First Minister prefers to talk about the future because she can't face up to her government's past. Thanks so much. I now call on Patrick Harvey. Six minutes, please, Mr Harvey. Presiding officer, um, can I thank the First Minister for the advance copy of her statement today and assure her that the Greens will also look forward to working constructively on a number of the areas that she 
has outlined. The focus on inequality uh, is something that she's spoken about on a number of occasions before, and if that does continue to be an element of our government's programme, we will certainly welcome it. We probably don't frame it in terms of economic growth as she does. We believe that inequality, as I'm sure she does as well, is a bad thing in its own right, not just detrimental uh, to what we regard as a short-term notion of economic growth. But the living wage is something that she's asserted in the past. We think there's more that could be done to promote the living wage. There's a wide range of business support services that the Scottish Government makes available which are not currently contingent on applicants uh, qualifying as living wage employers, and that's something that could drive uptake. There is going to have to be a recognition, however, that as a result of UK Government changes, not least on tax credits, a meaningful living, living wage is going to have to increase to ensure that people are not still living in poverty. I did find it rather galling that Ruth Davison seems uh, to uh, have expected some congratulation for the Tory government from the First Minister for Mr Osborne's announcement. Perhaps the answer is that the First Minister, just like the rest of, rest of us, can notice a con when we see one, and that any worker who has successfully campaigned who has successfully campaigned for a living wage in their own workplace has a right to feel insulted by the proposal that it be replaced by a living wage that's lower than the one that exists today. This government should see through that kind of con artistry, as I think most of this parliament does as well. I, I want to welcome in particular as well the abolition of employment tribunal fees. That will be a very positive step and the reversal of the Scottish Government's previous opposition to rent controls. Rent controls are something which are long overdue. We've made that case uh, for well over a year now, as have NUS, as has Shelter and other organisations, and I look forward to seeing the detail of that. There are some areas in the programme where I think we may need to simply wait and see what the detail has to say. The Commission on Local Tax Reform, for example, which is due to report soon, is something we've engaged with constructively. But we are going to have to wait and see what the Scottish Government has to say about its intentions for the way forward. Local democratic freedom, the ability for councils to decide for themselves how much revenue is right for them to raise and on what terms, that's going to have to be an important uh, measure that we take forward. And as for mitigation of the welfare cuts, an agenda which I think, again, we will share, the devil will be in the detail, and it will be for this Parliament, with its increased range of powers, to decide whether it's willing to raise the additional revenue that will be necessary if we're going to be successful in that agenda. The emphasis on education, which has come from both the government and the Labour benches, is, I think, important. I, I suppose my only concern here is that this simply becomes another political football where the shared intentions between government and main opposition party uh, fall down the crack between uh, a kind of political division about whose statistics are correct uh, or whose statistics are most meaningful. Instead of using or relying on its inbuilt majority, the government is going to have to make a case for the specific proposition it has uh, in this area, and all opposition parties should listen to that case with an open mind. The government's review on policing will be a welcome step, but I think, as uh, I think Willie Rennie was indicating as well, there is a need to recognise a wider culture within Police Scotland which has been too controlling from the centre uh, and that there's a deficit of local accountability which is inherent in the push toward a single police force to replace uh, the previous forces that existed in Scotland. That's a circle which is going to be difficult to square. As well as that, I think we need to have no patience in future in this Parliament with answers from ministers saying that merely operational matters are being discussed. When we're talking, for example, about the presence of weapons on our streets, when we're talking, for example, about the covert use of surveillance, either in relation to journalism or peaceful political activism, these are not merely operational matters. They are deeply political. And if the government wants to get to grips with that issue, uh, then I'll welcome it. But it remains to be seen. I do have to mention one or two negatives as well, though. I was disappointed to see not a single mention of climate change in the First Minister's statement today, or even the wider environmental agenda, despite the very serious challenge which exists, not just globally, in getting an agreement between governments uh, in Paris this year, 
but also here in Scotland, where the Scottish Government is yet to meet even one, even one of its annual climate change targets more than five years after that legislation was passed. The issue is mentioned in the, in the full uh, programme for government document tackling climate change, but I only need to turn one page to see a section headed investing in the oil and gas industry. And here we come to this long-standing contradiction between the Scottish Government's high-carbon, low-carbon economic and energy strategy. We cannot have it both ways. Kes Dugdale, I think, uh, actually mentioned uh, the concept of a post-oil economy, preparing for the transition to a post-oil economy. I'm happy to uh, let Ms Dugdale know that uh, Scottish Greens close. are well ahead of you, and I'll happily send a copy of our report on jobs in the new economy uh, to, to the Labour office. Finally, Deputy Presiding Officer, there was nothing in the statement or in the programme to give clarity from the Scottish Government on its position on fracking and the other forms of environmental threat that are coming from the fossil fuel industry. The moratorium must become a permanent ban. Its scope must be ex extended to include underground coal gasification. The First Minister says in her statement she's setting out a long-term vision, an agenda for the next Parliament. The SNP cannot go into the next election without giving voters clarity on what, what its intentions are in this most contentious area. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Many thanks. And we now move to open debate speeches, speeches of up to six minutes, please, as we're very tight for time. Now call on Linda Fabiani to be followed by Sarah Boyack. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm very positive um, about uh, the programme as put forward by Nicola Sturgeon because I think it very clearly builds on the achievements of over the last four years, uh, indeed prior to that too. Um, and as always, it has a very holistic uh, approach to things. It looks at the big picture as to how all the different elements of what our government's responsible for and what this parliament is responsible for scrutinising matches up to making Scotland the kind of country that we want it to be, ambitious for its people and really just fighting for more powers for Scotland so we can be more ambitious for people, but also delivering more powers for Scotland's communities. And of course, the main strands, uh, as outlined in the statement, and I look forward to reading more um, of that programme, would of course be uh, the economy, um, employment and fair work, welfare and housing, education and health, and of course, democracy. And can I say about democracy straight away, I really took offence to something that Kezia Dugdale said when she said that the Labour government established this parliament. No, it did not. The people of Scotland established this parliament. And that is at the very, very root of democracy. So let's not hear any more of that rewriting history. It starts to get absolutely... Bill Finlay. I wonder if she could advise us how democratic it is for the Scottish Government to impose uh, its position on local taxes on local government. Shouldn't it be up to local government to make those decisions? Yeah. President Officer, Mr Finlay has quite clearly not listened to anything that has been said about more powers for Scotland's communities, more powers for Scotland people, so that they really can take decisions as to what affects them in daily life. That's what this government is about. If he would pay more attention to looking at the legislative programme and the government that has gone on for the last eight years, he would realise it. Start getting a bit positive about how the opposition can actually help delivering for Scotland instead of trying to pull Scotland down at every available opportunity. And while we're at it, education is the big thing that's getting talked about just now. And again, Kezia Dugdale talked about education and the attainment gap and how Nicola Sturgeon has failed over the last eight years in making differences in deprived communities. Well, let me tell you, there's been decades of labour control in deprived communities right across our country. And we inherited an attainment gap. We inherited areas of multiple deprivation that people in the Labour Party should be absolutely ashamed of presiding over for all that time. Help us make it better, admit the mistakes of the past, look at history and move forward to the future, because together we can actually make changes. Ruth Davidson outlined with education how she thought it could be done in deprived areas 
with head teachers having more responsibility, etc. What I would say to Ruth Davidson is, how about eradicating poverty instead of embedding it? Yeah, yeah. That would make a difference. How about ensuring people have enough to eat rather than normalising food banks? Yeah. That would make a difference because there's a fundamental fact here. Hungry children find it more difficult to learn. I think that's something we can all agree on. And I would ask Ruth Davidson to look down at what our government's doing in Westminster and join the rest of us in condemning uh, what's happening there. The big picture of Scotland, Scotland the country it can be, being ambitious for all of its people. That's what I believe Nicola Sturgeon and her government are anxious to deliver. I've been looking at this programme in terms of business, what's been done there, small business bonus, and then um, more for small and medium enterprises, which are the bedrock of business in our communities right across. I'm looking at it as to how it can benefit my own community of East Kilbride, the town that I represent, the biggest town in Scotland, which has been suffering because of economic changes, because of austerity, because things have changed in terms of what kind of businesses are now there. I'm glad to see that there's going to be um, a new initiative about manufacturing, and I hope I'll be able to speak to the business team in the Scottish Government about how East Kilbride, through its task force, can start to capitalise on some of that. Margaret Mitchell. If she thinks the introduction of the empty property tax has helped businesses in East Kilbride, I contend it most certainly hasn't. De Fabiani. I think, presiding officer, yet again, we have people who will not look at the big picture and how we actually look at business as a whole, how it contributes and what is fair. Because one thing this government does is looks at what is fair, whether it's in helping employers and then fair work for employees. And can I say I'm absolutely delighted that there is going to be strong opposition to the terrible things that um, Margaret Mitchell's government is trying to do to workers' rights through the trade union bill. Absolutely. I could I say, and I see I'm running out of time very, very quickly, so much you more are. to say, um, but I would hope that the Labour Party in opposition at Westminster will be totally opposed to what the Conservatives are trying to do with that. I hope they will join with Scotland's main opposition party, uh, the SNP, in fighting what's going on down there. And let's look, yes, President Officer, I'll finish by saying, let's look at the bigger picture of how the Conservative government is damaging Scotland and look at how we can work with the SNP government in Scotland to mitigate it that and be positive for the future. Many thanks. <laughs> now call on Sarah Boyack to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The next eight months will see crucial decisions taken about our future. How we protect and make the best sustainable use of our land and seas. How we enable communities in urban and rural Scotland to tackle the environmental and social injustice that scars people's lives. And how we play our part in tackling the climate challenges that will destroy the livelihoods of millions across the globe. The Scottish Parliament should be proud of its record on land reform. Our 2003 Act enabled communities in some of the remotest parts of Scotland to make better use of the land, create new jobs and new opportunities. And Scottish Labour supported the new powers in this year's Community Empowerment Act because we believed it built on those achievements. It included urban areas and gave communities the chance of a greater say in the use of abandoned and neglected buildings and land. How this works in practice is critical, so we will be monitoring the new processes to ensure they deliver for communities. But there do remain key areas of unfinished business, particularly in relation to sustainable development, which we will debate this autumn. And the recommendations of the Land Reform Policy Group and the many submissions we've had from representatives across the country will be crucial. There are key issues I hope we will all agree need to be delivered such as clarity on the ownership of land. How can land be owned and yet there is no paper trail to find out who the owner is? The Land Reform Bill gives us the opportunity to deliver greater transparency and in committee, Scottish Labour will test the principles of the bill and the details in it too, working to ensure a decent deal for tenant farmers. 
There's much more the Scottish Government could be doing to tackle the challenges of climate change. I was disappointed and genuinely surprised that the issue did not even feature once in the First Minister's speech. With the Paris talks in December, we need radical action now. And yesterday's cross-party initiative by WWF saw all party leaders sign up for action. And the SNP government, with a clear majority, can move ahead with radical action now, and they need to do it without delay. The Scottish Government is failing on EU air quality targets and has now missed four annual climate targets. And although we've made progress on renewables, there is so much more that can be done. So, for example, we need to see the Scottish Government's budget reflect new investment in greening our infrastructure in our buildings and transport networks. The proposed National Energy Infrastructure Plan is long overdue and we need to see new investment on community heat and power to give robust solutions for community and cooperative uh, ways to move forward. But crucially, we need to retrofit homes to tackle the scandal of fuel poverty. It is not enough to build new affordable homes. We need to, we need to support the 39% of Scottish households who live in fuel poverty and the thousands in our rural communities who live in extreme fuel poverty. This is not a future challenge, it's a challenge now. Ian Gray's bus bill is one practical way in which we could invest to deliver sustainable public transport, support demand-led and community transport initiatives and move the agenda forward. So will the Scottish Government now sign up to its provisions? Across the rest of the UK, local authorities are beginning to work together on franchising and supporting bus regulation across local authority boundaries. So why not here in Scotland too? I'd like to know what the Scottish Government's view is on the new raft of city deals that are being agreed across the country. Will it be possible for new bus options to appear in them? That could be a practical way to tackle and deliver on sustainable transport. On Thursday, we're going to hear a statement from ministers on the future for people in Long Annet. It highlights the need for a practical transition now towards a greener energy future. We're losing jobs and expertise across the country, and particularly down the East Coast, from Aberdeen to Fife. And before more jobs are lost, we need to hear more about practical so tr solutions, a practical transition from ministers. We've got to work with energy companies and communities now to ensure that vital skills and supply industries are not lost for the future. Throughout the summer, we've seen the dairy crisis continue. We've now reached a point where costs are cut, and the pressure on payments continues to go below what is viable for farmers to produce milk. When water is more expensive than milk, surely something is seriously out of kilter. So I welcome the Scottish Government's Dairy Action Plan, but farmers need to see it delivered with a much greater sense of urgency. More transparency in the whole supply chain, investment in product diversification, and support for the public and private sectors to actively source produce of Scottish provenance. We need that now more than ever. It's been a horrendous summer for our farming communities and the rural jobs which depend on them and the autumn will see yet more challenges. So can the Scottish Government confirm today that single farm payments will be processed and paid on time? Our producers and the rural jobs and industries they support need that certainty. Presiding officer, we need to know from the Scottish Government that it is focused on protecting and creating new jobs, whether it's in energy, in transport, in farming or food production, that it will use its budget to green our infrastructure, to tackle fuel poverty now and to enable the Scottish Government to deliver on our climate targets and deliver environmental justice for all. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Mark MacDonald to be followed by Claire Baker. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, before we came back to Parliament, um, uh, I ran the emotional gauntlet of sending my daughter off for her first day at primary school, which um, the tears were, were not flowing, um, but uh, she has um, been keeping me up to date with all of the things that she has been learning. But it's helped me put into focus and context um, my aspirations for her and from that my aspirations as a politician for the children of Scotland, because that is now both of my children into the education system, um, and I want to ensure that we have an education system that is absolutely working for all of the children who are within it. And that's why I've welcomed uh, the extension of the attainment fund that took place over the summer, which will see 
uh, two schools in my constituency, Manor Park and Bramble Bray, benefit from that funding. Manor Park and Bramble Bray are schools which are doing a tremendous amount of work in communities of deprivation within Aberdeen. Um, but as has been highlighted, um, and I've said in the Chamber, um, there is a world outside of the school gates presiding officer which affects the chances of children and often what we find is that the schools that the children attend are working against external factors rather than being able to absolutely maximise the educational outcomes for our children. So absolutely uh, the work that is being done within our schools is vital but that wrap around outside the school, uh, many of those factors which lie out with the control of the Scottish Government is important as well although I'll come on to talk a little bit more a little bit more about some of those things. Also, the expansion of childcare and, uh, at the early years is important and welcome. Uh, and the plans to go further, I think, will be of benefit not just to children, but also to parents. Parents who will be able to take the opportunity, should they choose to do so, to get back into the workforce at an earlier point than might otherwise have been the case. I welcome the announcement that the Energy Jobs Task Force will be extended for six months, although this obviously is a bittersweet welcome, given that there are still pressures facing those working in the energy sector, many of whom are my constituents. Indeed, just recently, there were some uh, regrettable announcements regarding helicopter pilot jobs. Uh, one of the things that's been raised with me is the difficulty for helicopter pilots in finding alternative employment because there are not a lot of helicopter jobs available out there and the options and opportunities for reskilling those who find themselves in a position of redundancy uh, is something that I hope the Energy Jobs Task Force will be looking at as part of its work. But this is support for a key sector within the northeast of Scotland. But there are other key sectors as well. And often one of the, the, the issues that has been raised with me is that we don't always hear enough about the other sectors that exist within the northeast of Scotland. One of those is life sciences. And I welcome the fact that it will continue to be a focus of the government's economic strategy. Uh, I visited uh, a company in my constituency, Nova Biotics, uh, over the summer alongside uh, the Minister for uh, Mental Health, uh, Health Improvement and Sport, Jamie Hepburn. Uh, they are developing uh, and working on a treatment for cystic fibrosis and are doing some fantastic work. They are a spin-out company from the uh, Rowett Research Institute. Uh, and I think those kind of spin-out life sciences companies are the kind of companies that we want to see being fostered and supported. Uh, and I know that they are grateful for the support that the Scottish Government is giving to the life sciences sector. Beyond that, uh, presiding officer, but within the energy sector, one of the decisions that I think needs to be uh, probed quite seriously is the bizarre decision by the UK government to apply the climate change levy to the renewable energy sector, a decision which seems absolutely and utterly uh, without uh, rhyme nor reason, but has been taken nonetheless. And that will do a significant amount of harm, I feel, to our uh, attempts to diversify the energy sector within Scotland. In terms of the health sector uh, and the improvements that have been made there, I believe that uh, there have been improvements in terms of the, uh, the, the health uh, of our nation and also the experience of people in accessing our NHS. As the First Minister highlighted, we now have a greater number of people waiting for a shorter period of time uh, within the health service. That, by any measure, is improvement. But I also welcome the moves in the primary care sector and the health secretary and I have had a number of discussions regarding the issues around primary care and, and general practice, particularly some of the pressures that are being experienced within my own constituency. I met again with local GPs recently who uh, are uh, looking uh, at a local level around how primary care will be shaped and delivered. Uh, I also, uh, during the same uh, day that the Minister for Health Improvement was in my constituency, visited the Middlefield Healthy House and nurse practice practitioner-led service, which is delivering very strong support for a community of deprivation in my constituency. And I believe that there are a number of ways in which uh, the primary care sector can complement across disciplines in order to reduce some workload, but also to improve patient uh, experience and patient outcomes. And I know that's something that the Cabinet Secretary and I have spoken about, and I know it's something that she is very keen to explore as well. 
and then on to the issue uh, around social justice and improvement of living standards. And I mentioned the factors that exist outside of the school gate which affect children's life chances and children's educational outcomes. And one of those is around income uh, and the uh, difficulties that many people have in communities in sustaining uh, without the requirement for, for example, tax credits, which we know are about to come under significant attack from the UK government. The living wage is crucial. And the reason why it's called the real living wage and not the, the phony living wage that the Conservatives are putting forward is because it actually meets the standards of the living wage and hasn't just been a repackaging of the minimum wage because we know that the £9 an hour that they trumpet will not be a living wage by the time it comes into force. That sort of work is important to ensure living standards increase and to ensure that families have the best possible opportunities in our society. I welcome this programme for government because it is ambitious for and about Scotland. Thanks very much. And I now call on Claire Baker to be followed by Fiona MacLeod. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, with the election on the horizon, this is a shorter year than is normal, but it's just as important that we do use the time that we have to make some progress in a number of key areas. Uh, the First Minister has come forward today with a number of proposals. She talks about transferring power to local communities and community empowerment in the closing of her speech. Um, this will be a challenge in terms of finance, capacity and sustainability in some communities, but the prize for this is great. We could see people engage much more in their communities, making decisions every day rather than just um, at the ballot box. I would like to touch briefly on land reform. And it was previously recently revealed in Private Eye that 750,000 acres of land in Scotland, which is an area larger than the First Minister's home region of Ayrshire, is held in tax havens. In last year's programme for government, the First Minister said that her ambition for radical reform remains undiminished. Um, but there have been areas where campaigners have been disappointed, including the lack of plans to tackle land held in tax havens. Uh, reform of our land is an opportunity to change who holds power in Scotland. This should be a parliament which challenges old consensus. Uh, land reform is one of the great success stories of this young parliament, but we can still be more ambitious. Uh, and the government was forced to redesign the land reform group after a weak start and the group did finally produce a report that had a host of recommendations that were designed to take the process forward. Um, and the government have adopted a number of these within the legislation but I hope they will take another look at the plans to bar companies and offshore tax havens from holding title to land and property in Scotland. We do need greater transparency within ownership and unless action is taken we will start to see the ridiculous situation where Scotland will fall behind the rest of the UK as the Conservative Prime Minister has announced plans to publish a central public land registry of foreign companies um, that own land in England and Wales. And there's a real need and desire to see um, the Scottish Government match at least this level of um, transparency. Um, I'd like to now talk about educational attainment, an issue which Kezia Dugdale has championed in this Parliament. And there are um, still too many young people who leave school not achieving as much as they should have. And Kezia Dugdale outlined some of the stark figures that we face in trying to address this. Um, last year I visited Kirkland High School in um, Buckhaven in Methyl um, for their end of year show and Kirkland was a school of ambition. That was a scheme that along with cultural coordinators was introduced by the last Labour-led executive but both of them were brought to an end by the current government. Um, but in 2014 I could still see the impact that these initiatives were having on that school, on the pupils, their teachers, their parents and their community as a whole. And what I saw was engagement with the arts and culture from pupils who might otherwise struggle to have these experiences. They showed confidence, teamwork and were a great argument for why arts and creativity are so important. And yet when we look at who is reaching the attainment levels needed for art college acceptance or entry to the conservatoire, we see groups of young people for whom a career in the arts is just not possible because of a combination of financial constraints and lack of opportunity. Um, the actor James McAvoy recently stepped into the debate saying that while no one detracts from the talent and success of actors who come from privileged backgrounds, we are really worried about a society that doesn't give opportunities to everyone from every walk of life to get into the arts and that is what is happening. There should be no profession where a talented child or young person, um, regardless of their family income or circumstances, should be excluded from. If you look forward to the coming months in Parliament, there are two further areas I'd like to consider which are in the programme for government. Um, an EU referendum is coming and we must be fully engaged in that debate. So far the focus has been on the process, but we need to move on to the actual meat and substance of the debate. 
We cannot take the result in Scotland here for granted. Many in Scotland will not have made up their minds about this issue. Uh, we can't yet see the shape of the campaign, but it will be another yes-no um, type campaign. There will be strong arguments put across, um, across the political and social spectrum that the EU doesn't work within Scotland's interests. Um, people will argue um, from the, about the political direction of the EU. Um, the campaign against TTIP will be highlighted as a concern and concerns over business regulations. Uh, we must be, those of us in the Chamber who support continued membership must be ready to engage with these arguments and to meet the criticisms if we are to remain within the EU. The EU does need to change, but this reform must be achieved from within the EU. And membership is so important to our economy. The First Minister talked about international exports. Continuing membership is so crucial to all of this. Um, I will close with some comments on the BBC. The First Minister talked about additional powers for Scotland. The Scottish Parliament and the Government will have greater power in the Charter of Renewal process, but with power comes responsibility. Um, the debate cannot be driven by political ideology, nor must it be about settling old scores. We must choose our words carefully, refrain from threats and ultimatums, and work towards securing a deal that works for the BBC and licence fee payers. It is important that we use the correct facts, and I, I was disappointed by Bill Kidd's motion last week, where he said that the BBC Scotland budget was between 30 and 35 million, despite the budget of the BBC Scotland being almost seven times that. And it's not conducive to an honest debate about the future of the BBC to have misinformation around. The BBC has some great talent working here in Scotland, and it is a vital partner in developing the sector and the skills needed. And we will have a more full discussion about this on Thursday. We must not lose sight of this during the charter renewal process and that is why Scottish Labour wants to see investment from within the licence fee settlement and we want to see the retention of the quota system for commissioning from nations and regions. Um, presiding officer, on the issue of the BBC and the EU referendum, we must make sure that during the months ahead we work together where we agree and constructively where we don't. We should positively engage with the future of the EU and the BBC, take an inclusive approach that puts people, not politics, at the centre of these decisions. Many thanks. I now call on Fiona MacLeod to be followed by Liz Smith. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And uh, I would like to welcome the programme for government. Um, so much in it uh, that's so impressive. And to echo Linda Fabiani's comments about the positivity of it. And it's good to hear that in a number, if not all, of the contributions this afternoon. The First Minister made much in her uh, speech about attainment, and that's what I wish to concentrate my remarks on, most specifically on literacy. Now, many of you in the Chamber will probably expect the librarian in me wanting to take part in a debate on literacy, but actually, this debate about literacy and tr closing the attainment gap is a debate about equality. It's a debate about equality in access to education, it's a debate about equality in access to health because health literacy is proven to be part of being, a, a, being better in terms of health. It's also a debate on equality in terms of employment and therefore breaking down poverty. And when we talk about literacy, we should talk about it from the earliest years all the way through to adulthood. Um, the Standing Literacy Commission uh, published its report in, uh, earlier this year in 2015. Now, the Standing Literacy Commission set up by the Scottish Government was initially chaired by Sir Harry Burns when he was the Chief Medical Officer. And that raised eyebrows at the time. But Sir Harry Burns can tell you absolutely clearly that literacy is a part, as I've said, about education, about health and about breaking poverty. And the Scottish Literacy Commission makes it quite clear in some of the statistics it gives that in the world rankings, Scotland has a 99% literacy level. That sounds marvellous, doesn't it? It puts us in something like the top 20 countries in the world. But as the Literacy Commission also highlighted, it's the gap between those with high functioning literacy and those with poorly functioning literacy that is the biggest problem that faces us. Now, the most recent SIMD uh, surveys have showed that that uh, literacy gap is narrowing and that is to be welcomed. But we mustn't stop there, as the First Minister said. And I I, today, listening to the First Minister and to hear about the ambitions that this SNP government has to close that literacy gap is so important. The First Minister told us about the attainment challenge accompanied with the £100 million attainment challenge fund. She also talked about 
We have moved from up to 600 hours per annum of early learning and childcare for all three and four year olds and many of our two year olds and how our ambition, if we are elected to government next year, is to move that to 1,140 hours. Now, both main leaders of the opposition parties spoke about that in quite disparaging terms. And I would just like to, especially to Ms Dugdale, to say, I spent this summer travelling the length of this country from Dumfries to Inverness and also east and west, looking at the challenges of delivering the 600 hours and how we have met them, and looking at how our local authorities, in partnership with private nurseries and third sector nurseries, are already planning and, in many cases, implementing the flexibility that our working parents need. So I know that Ms Dugdale was otherwise involved, uh, involved this summer in an election while I was out touring the country, but we need to look at the facts uh, before we disparage the work. Can I also very uh, quickly highlight a couple of the uh, areas where this government is already working and already being evaluated as working uh, well in trying to uh, narrow the literacy gap? One of the delights for me is, and I don't know how many know, people know about Bookbug, four times in a child's life from birth to primary one, they will receive one of these bags filled with books. But it's not just about books and it's not just about reading. What we do when we work with our youngest children is we're working on attachment, we're working on relationships, we're working on emotional literacy. We're not just working with those young children, but we're encouraging their parents and their carers to be part of that learning journey for those young people. A couple of other items I really have to highlight because they're so exciting. The play talk read strategy that we have for our older children. If nobody has been on a play talk read bus, please, when one of the three buses come to your constituency, go on the bus and see the delight of the children, the parents, the carers, when they're playing, talking and reading. And if they're not coming to your constituency, get in touch and find out how you can get them to come to your constituency. Uh, an allied uh, um, uh, initiative that we have is the NHS Play at Home, evaluated highly by QMU in 2011. And of course, the recently announced Read Write Count. If nobody's seen the videos on the government website about how you can use going for the messages to raise the literacy levels, but also your attachment with your child, you really need to look at them. They're amazing. Very clear that I've only got a few seconds left, but so can I conclude with all the many other things that I could have brought to your attention. But I was just conscious, um, in the book bug bag, I came across a quote from Albert Einstein. If you want your children to be intelligent, read them fairy tales. If you want them to be more intelligent, read them more fairy tales. And I absolutely recommend that, but certainly not the fairy tales we heard from Ruth Davidson this afternoon. So in closing, presiding officer, it's fun, it's creative, it's academically evaluated. Let's infect everyone with the enthusiasm across Scotland. Thank you. Many thanks. Now I call on Liz Smith to be followed by Rob Gibson. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Uh, two weeks ago, when the first minister told us uh, boldly, it has to be said, that her neck was on the line when it came to the attainment gap, there was a very welcome acceptance, I thought, that this was one of the uh, major educational challenges facing the government. She spoke, too, about the successes that she saw, the fact that 500 new schools have been rebuilt and refurbished in 2007, that the numbers staying on in S6 and in meaningful school leaver destinations are increasing, and notwithstanding some of the controversies over SQA in the summer, that there have been record passes at higher and advanced higher. But when the First Minister talks about success in education, it's noticeable that most of the national measures that she uses to support that assertion are quantitative, and they do not tell us much, if anything at all, about the overall qualitative changes in pupils' learning. While there are, and there always will be, beacons of success with qual qualitative improvement in individual schools, quite frankly, no one believes the First Minister when either she or her Education Secretary tells us that standards have risen and are continuing to rise. And why? Because of the fact that every educational expert in the land tells us that between one in five and one in six pupils is still leaving school functionally illiterate. Because of the most recent statistics which show that in many aspects of literacy and numeracy, Scotland has gone backwards, 
And for me, a very telling statistic, which was used by the First Minister herself, when she said that 69% of schools are classified in school inspections as being good, very good and excellent. That means that 31% of schools, which is approximately 210,000 pupils, are not in that category. And that is a damning indictment. Now, the First Minister has said on several occasions that she will listen to good ideas from other parties. And maybe today's U-turn when it comes to testing is one of them. But there are others where we have met with a brick wall. So if she won't listen to the politicians, perhaps she will listen to the, to the experts in education. To Keir Bloomer, when he analyses the issues within literacy and numeracy and the attainment gap. While praising the First Minister for at last being prepared to grasp the large and difficult nettle, he makes the comment that when change is mooted by opposition parties, it is rejected because it is not seen to promote egalitarianism. If new policies involve different organisation in schools, greater devolution to head teachers and more choice to parents, they are dismissed because of the mistaken belief that egalitarianism and uniformity are the same thing. Or Sue Ellis, who argues very convincingly that not only is there a significant lack of meaningful data, which the First Minister has addressed this afternoon, but also an absence of a consistent approach when it comes to following the child through the school, something that my uh, colleague Mary Scanlon also indicated at the time of the Audit Scotland inquiry. These experts make very clear that advice to teachers is very weak, and so Ruth Davidson is quite right when she focuses on teacher training and on the fact that there are fewer hours devoted to literacy and numeracy teaching in Scotland compared uh, with England. Now, the Scottish Government is rightly very keen to stress the importance of the early years, and they can take some credit for some pioneering work that has been done across Scotland. However, that effort will be compromised for as long as too many families are finding it difficult, or in some cases are actually prevented from accessing good quality and flexible childcare. Twice in this chamber, we debated the evidence provided by fair funding for our kids, who argued, and I quote, for many children and working parents, the system is simply not delivering the model of childcare that matches the needs of modern working families. And the evidence that was provided by Reform Scotland who flagged up the inherent unfairness within a nursery system which prevents approximately half of chil children in Scotland from receiving the same entitlement just because they happen to be born in the wrong month. The First Minister made a welcome announcement about the discrimination that was affecting kinship carers. So perhaps the First Minister could turn her attention to the discrimination within the uh, nursery provision. And at the other end of the scale, we know exactly what's happening to colleges, despite their extraordinary collective efforts to provide a top-class education, greater accessibility and more support for those often furthest from the labour market. They have seen their real-term funding cut. They have seen substantial cuts in college places. They've seen lecturer numbers decrease. And they've had to undergo very serious financial pressures on their reserves because of ONS classification. But we know that the FE sector is not alone because the HE sector is now facing exactly the same threat, all because the Scottish Government wants to exert more control over the running of our universities. And they proclaim that they want to do this because they allege that there is insufficient transparency within university governance and therefore insufficient accountability for the public money which underpins what they spend. Now, I have tried several times before, and I'm going to try again this afternoon, to ask the Scottish Government for one shred of evidence to prove that the existing system of university governance is in some way undermining the educational experience or holding back universities as they compete internationally. No. The fact of the matter is that the HE bill is a mess and it is politically driven and it has so many technical problems in it that it will need radical change if not have to be abolished altogether. <laughs> First Minister, Ruth Davidson made it plain earlier this afternoon that this party will very strongly support anything that can reduce the attainment gap and can provide effective testing. But what we cannot accept, and what the, the public is really struggling to understand, is why the SNP has become obsessed with university governance when no problem exists, forcing named persons on all children under 18 when it's quite clear that the vast majority of parents do not either want or need a named person, why they are obsessed with attacking colleges and refusing to budge when parents demand that the date of a child's birthday should not determine the provision of nursery. First Minister, Dr. I know Close, you're not please. in the chamber, but I do hope you will listen to what is being said. Is it not time to do more U-turns so that we really deliver on what matters? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks very much. We now call on Rob Gibson to be followed by Ken McIntosh. 
Thank you, President Officer. Well, it's an exciting government programme that we're debating today in this final session of this term. And uh, I see in uh, my responsibilities that land reform is central to the quest for fairness and equality, and building a sustainable Scotland is one of our core purposes. Uh, to quote uh, Eric Schumacher in Small is Beautiful, among material resources, the greatest unquestionably is the land. Study how a society uses its land and you can come to pretty reliable conclusions as to what its future will be. That's exactly what we will be doing in the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. We will be building on the Acts of 2003 on land reform and the Community Empowerment Act of past this June. Now, I've read most of the submissions, the 200 submissions to the Rural Affairs Committee for this land reform bill. And it takes many points from many different aspects. And I hope that over the next three months, we will hear those and come to our conclusions about the best ways forward for land reform. Because we are trying to see that the encouraging and supporting of responsible and diverse land ownership is one of the key issues, as is addressing fairness, equality and social justice connected to ownership of access to and use of land in Scotland. But two areas of uh, the issue have been raised by other members and indeed by the public at this stage. And I want to comment on these. They follow on from issues in the Land Reform Review Group report. One is about non-EU land ownership in Scotland and the other is about human rights. And, you know, I'm surprised that the opposition hasn't seen the explanations of why the bill doesn't include at this stage uh, non-EU-based uh, legal entities being banned. Because the NFU in Scotland has told its members that the Scottish Government considers that this would not achieve the policy objective, as it would still allow the use of complex corporate structures and trusts to obscure how land is owned and managed in Scotland. And therefore, the Scottish Government intends to bring forward regulations making powers to require disclosure of certain information on a proprietor or tenant in Scotland. This will be done on a case-by-case -case basis where it can be demonstrated that lack of information can be shown to have an adverse effect. That being so, we will look at these things in great detail in our committee. And on human rights, because ECHR is included in the Scotland Act, I turn to the final words of Kirstine Shields in the uh, Green Scottish Human Rights Journal when she says on this matter, if the body of ECHR law is incorporated appropriately, the land reform debate offers an opportunity to rescue rights from their um, uh, misrepresentation and to re-establish the ECHR as an institution which responds to the prevailing needs of societies and aligns state power to address those needs. ECHR isn't about property rights and landlords' rights. It's about human rights, and we intend to investigate that in great detail. But turning to another wider issue, which uh, is uh, encompassed in Europe and much broader than that, the approach of the Paris Land, uh, uh, the Climate Change Conference, requires us to reflect on the bigger picture as far as uh, affects the way in which this Scottish Government can act. And I turn to the example that in July, the French Government announced a package of measures that would turn around its energy production. In short, it would see a greater emphasis and investment on renewable energy and a cut on the reliance on nuclear. Contrast that with the UK Conservative Government, who now seems is clearly waging an all-out war on renewables. What are we seeing develop as a tale of two governments, not just the French and UK governments, but the government in London and the government in Scotland? And therefore, communities, businesses and environment should benefit and most certainly are going to be hit most by these changes from London. I'll take an intervention. Patrick Harvey. I'm grateful to the member for giving way, and I agree with his criticism of the UK government's recent energy announcements. But what we're looking at here is the Scottish government's uh, programme for government in this final year. After four missed climate change targets, does the member know why we've not had any new policy announcements today intended to get us back on track? Rob Gibson. Well, targets are one thing, but the tra trajectory of change towards achieving our goals is on target. And the First Minister 
and the Energy Minister, Fergus Ewing, uh, pointed out that it's anti-business to stop us actually developing one of the things that helps us most to achieve our climate targets. That is renewable energy. That's what the Conservatives are doing to us at the moment, potentially costing around £3 billion of investment and risking perhaps 5,000 jobs. Yes, the trajectory is correct. We proved that. The targets as such, no thank you. I don't want any intervention from people who have only just found out that climate change exists. Last June, the UK Climate Change Committee published a sobering report if you could wind up. what the realities of climate change will bring. These included uh, increases in flooding and rising temperatures. This would cause dangers to our way of life and the loss of some of our best farmland. So therefore, it's an attack on uh, renewable energy, which we're up against and which we have to fight against. And indeed, this December, the climate uh, uh, summit in Paris will wonder why a British government is going there and arguing exactly the opposite, and why the Scottish government's hands are too tied at the moment over energy policy and climate change policy to succeed. Member has literally just finished. Ken McIntosh, followed by Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I hope yourself and colleagues enjoyed a slightly more uh, relaxing and successful summer than uh, perhaps all of us in the Chamber. Uh, if I may put this as objectively as I can, and without meaning to sound envious in any way, I think it's fair to say that the SNP... One moment. Can we... That's better. I think it's fair to say the SNP Government is in a very strong position at the moment. You'll change your mind shortly. An absolute majority here in the Scottish Parliament riding high in the polls and with the First Minister very much in her political honeymoon. If ever there was a time for this government to do something different, to push for real change or to be bold and radical, this is it. These moments do not come along that often. And if I think back to the last time perhaps my party enjoyed such a position of political strength, it was probably <coughs> 1999, and that term was marked by notable successes and achievements. Uh, a huge expansion of nursery and higher education, the restoration of public services, investment in teachers and health workers' pay, the school buildings programme, the introduction of free personal care. Now, even if we recognise that there was a different financial climate, it was also marked by landmark legislative success, such as the Land Reform Act, the abolition of feudal tenure, uh, the smoking ban, the abolition of Section 28, the Adults with Incapacity Act. I could go on. But, presenting officer, I think, if I'm being entirely honest, I am not sure today's announcement of a vision for the next decade does stand comparison. Now, I noticed that the First Minister did use the word bold, in trailing the programme for government. But although there are several announcements which we will welcome, it feels more worthy than inspired. And yes, I do welcome uh, announcements on tackling educational attainment, for example, or housing. But they feel like an attempt to correct past mistakes, to put right some of the poorer decisions taken over the last eight years, rather than stepping out in a new direction. I'm also unsure as to how the government's stated plans for the next few years sit alongside day-to-day -day reality for most Scots. When you ask local people in my area about public services, for example, they'll give you a list of issues they are wrestling with. Selling off the last publicly owned care home in the area, trying to find ways to prevent the local dementia service support from being reduced, getting rid of school librarians, closing a centre for people with additional needs fighting for an even semi-decent public transport connection to our hospital, long waits for hospital treatment. Now, as colleagues will recognise, in the majority of the examples I've listed, local government is at the sharp end of most of these political decisions. But there's very little in today's programme for government which offers much in the way of comfort. And when you ask any colleagues from local government what they want this administration to address, what they wanted to hear today from the programme for government, the overwhelming response is to identify local government finance. It is unsustainable to continue to cut central government grant to our local authorities whilst also underfunding a centrally imposed council tax freeze. Now, Scottish Labour has been working with the Commission on Local Taxation to come up with a sustainable long-term solution, and we await that report uh, to be published in the autumn with interest. But none of that stops the Scottish Government from sending out a strong and clear message now about their direction of travel, about their trajectory, if I may put it that way, Mr Gibson. It is also directly contradictory to talk about transferring more power to our communities 
our communities whilst emasculating our local authorities when it comes to exercising any kind of fiscal responsibility. Yes, there is reference to the Community Empowerment Act, which Labour fully supported and supports, and, which we, and we are similarly looking forward to uh, possible legislation for our islands. But these are quite specific examples which stand out almost because they are exceptions. Now, I know that the First Minister and our colleagues are sensitive to the accusation that this is a centralising and overly controlling administration and that we are in danger of living in a one-party state. Well, surely this is the perfect opportunity to rebut that charge. Council colleagues are willing to stand up and to take the tough decisions that need to be taken, but they need to feel they have the support of government ministers, not worry that they are to be blamed by them. And if alongside my worries about local government and the future of public services, of all the areas where I was looking for a bold and ambitious plan from this government, housing was probably top of my list. Scarcely a week has gone by uh, this summer without further evidence or a new report highlighting the housing problems facing so many Scots. Just last month, the proportion of Scots owning their own home hit a 15-year low, whilst the number renting privately hit a 15-year high. In fact, the amount paid in rent by tenants in private lets is at an all-time high. People are either paying too much, living in inadequate accommodation, or both. Now, we urgently need to build more homes, and we need to build more homes for social rent in particular. Now, again, there are announcements in today's uh, programme which are to be welcomed, but they lack detail, and in fact, it's very di difficult to describe the sum total as bold or ambitious. <coughs> On planning, for example, I welcome the announcement of a, a root and branch review. But the First Minister has simply stated that the intention of this review is to help deliver more homes, and that scarcely does justice to the complexity of the issue. And I'd welcome further information on this point. At the, number, at the moment, the number of local planning decisions overruled by the Scottish Government has unfortunately had the effect of undermining confidence in the whole system. And there will be many like me who warmed the idea of a housing fund to address the specific needs of rural communities. Uh, but can I ask... You're in your last 30 seconds. Even an indication of how much this fund will amount to. And can I also ask whether it is a fund solely for new-built homes or will, it be, uh, will people be able to access it to address the pressing needs of fuel poverty? The Help the Buy scheme, too, it should continue. I'm glad that they're going to announce it over the next three years. Presenting officer, I can tell you and the Chamber that Labour will bring forward housing as our first subject for debate in the new session. And I hope we can agree on a genuine ambition for our country that all Scots can enjoy the benefit of a warm, secure and affordable home wherever they live in this country. Thank you, Mr McIntosh. I now call Christine Graham to be followed by Neil Finlay. A strict six minutes, Ms Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to put on record my regard for Chief Constable Sir Stephen House for his service, particularly in the two years since the inception of Police Scotland, and do not underestimate his commitment to the service. Not that he would always have known it, because he had sometimes, and rightly, a rough ride from the policing committee, which I chair, as indeed did Vic Emery. But it was a tough task against a tight timescale. Eight constabularies into one, eight cultures into one, together with substantial savings required because of cuts to the budget. The spotlight on Police Scotland is as never before, with Her Majesty's Inspectorate, the Policing Committee here, Audit Scotland, opposition quite rightly, and the uh, press. But sadly, to some extent, it's gone too far, politicising policing, because I think Willie Rennie does a disservice to his party as well as the police by over-egging the pudding. Chairing the police committee, I have a handful of emails concerning the establishment of Police Scotland and only one complaining of delivery of the service from someone in my constituency. And it's not that I'm not looking for it, that's all I've had. It is not the talk of the steamy. So the doom and gloom that Willie Rennie had today and has before does a disservice more particularly to our frontline officers, delivering drops in knife crime, fear of crime, the perception of it even at an all-time low. Yes, there have been mistakes with Police Scotland, and I think more particularly with the SPA. Yes, we need rebalancing, but to say that Police Scotland on its knees is a complete nonsense. Recall necessity here was a mother of invention, Swinging cuts to our budget, rather than lose the 17,000 frontline officers that have had to do in England, we retain police numbers. 11 million still requires to be culled from that budget. And I say to the opposition members here, I know they've only got one of each at Westminster, but over 40 million in VAT receipts is retained from Police Scotland and the Fire and Rescue Service, and it could come back here and it would cover those cuts. 
The exemption is in Northern Ireland. The exemption is to the Olympic Legacy Committee that started out as a London charity, but it's been extended to them. So I would ask them to say to their colleagues at Westminster, this is an injustice to the Police Service and the Fire and Rescue Service of Scotland. But there are issues for Police Scotland remaining, and I think the government has recognised it because one man was not the fault or two men were not the fault. Scrutiny, the SPA no doubt lost its way, didn't seem to know what it was to be doing. I welcome the fact that this is going to be reviewed. I do think it's essential that there's a rebalancing between national and local priorities and in the perception of that. Accountability, appear, accountability appears to have shifted too far to the centre and I welcome it coming back. Although, as the First Minister says, access to major facilities is nationwide now. If you need a helicopter because somebody's gone missing in the borders or in the highlands and islands, you will get it as a matter of necessity, not because you have to put in a bit of paper and make a request. So the facilities available are much better. HMIC, I'm glad it's doing a review of call handling. I have to say I regret the fact that it has to some extent got preceded by the recent tragic events on the M9, but we mustn't preempt that review. We don't know what went wrong there. So I'm, I'm, I'm really loath to make comment until we have the facts before us. I'm glad there'll be a statutory code of practice and stop and search, perhaps with some clarity in this, because sometimes young people are stopped and searched because it's a child protection issue. They may be carrying drugs or alcohol and the police are doing it for their own safety. If they're searching a buggy or a pushchair or a pram, it may be because the adult has secreted the offensive item in that pram or pushchair. So it's not a black and white issue. That's why we require this uh, statutory guidance. I would also say that the focus on community justice, which the Justice Committee began today in the bill, is very important. It sounds like a strange and drab thing, but it, it's to do with stopping reoffending. And reoffending is bad for society, it's bad for the victims, it's bad for the people involved, it's bad for their families, and it costs an arm and a leg. So I'm very glad that we're doing that. And finally, on to the issue of the Abusive Behaviour and Sexual Harm Bill. I, I, this is very important to bring us into line with the movements in technology, where people unaware that later on they can be blackmailed or humiliated by revenge, what we might call revenge porn, private images, we must put a step, stop to that. And that is something I think that every the chamber would welcome. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Thank you. I call Neil Finlay to be followed by Kevin Stewart. Six minutes. Thanks, Presiding Officer. Um, I unequivoc unequivocally support our public services. Uh, having worked in housing and education and been a councillor for nine years, I have seen how high quality services change people's lives uh, for the better. However, what we see at the moment is our public services under pressure like never before. And the NHS problems pile higher and higher each day. We see more GPs closing their doors to new patients, hospitals uh, relying on bank and agency and private sector staff. Uh, at St John's Hospital, and I'm glad the, uh, the, the local uh, constituency members here and the Health Secretary at St John's Hospital, we know over the summer that the Children's Ward had to close its 24-7 inpatient service again. And in Lothian, one in seven hospital beds are taken up by people well enough to go home and could go home if the social care system could cope with them. One in seven beds. In local government, the front line in the fight against poverty and inequality, we see budgets uh, not being cut to the bone. We're way past the bone. We're now deep and hard into the marrow. And the impact of that is all too evident on our communities. Jobs lost, roads and environmental decline, uh, community education cuts, support for elderly and disabled services reduced. We see bus fares rising and schools with fewer materials and support staff and housing budgets cut. My own council, West Lothian, UK Council of the Year in 2006, has had to cut £89 million from its budget at the same time, uh, this, uh, at the same time as this has happened. We are supposed to go on and cheer as a centralised government dictates that councils have to reward the well-off most with a freeze in local taxes. You cannot claim to oppose austerity and its consequences with such an, a regressive approach to local government. And in education, it appears that after eight years, the Scottish Government has realised there is an, an attainment uh, gap in education. 
Well, of course, if you remove classroom assistance, if you cut teaching equipment budgets, if you can't get an appointment with an educational psychologist, if, your child, uh, if, if as a child you return home where your mum or dad or brother or sister can't access mental health support or drug or alcohol counselling, if you're a young carer or a child in care and social work and education budgets are slashed, is it any wonder that the, edu the education attainment gap widens? And of course, for many young people who want to bridge the attainment gap after leaving school, college is their destination, yet here we see fewer staff, reduced teaching time, student support cut, and over 100,000 places lost. This is not the way to reduce the attainment gap. And if we're serious about addressing inequality, then we have to be serious about redistributing wealth and power. Uh, if we fail to levy or collect taxes, if we provide tax cuts or freezes for the rich whilst the poor are forced to attend food banks, then you'll never address Scotland's real shame of inequality. And the educational attainment gap is a manifestation of this inequality. Of course, we know the Tory government exists to make the country more equal. The growing gulf between rich and poor is meant to happen. That's what's meant to happen under their system of austerity. And they, they absolutely practice redistribution. Of course they do. But it's redistribution from the poor to the rich. And they attack anyone, anyone who challenges that agenda. That's why they have brought forward the trade union bill, an unprecedented attack on the right to organise in the workplace. Trade unions exist to fight for better wages, health and safety, pensions, gender equality. And this bill wants us to return to the 18th century master and servant view of industrial relations, where corporate power is entrenched by a legal system that prevents collective organisation. No worker ever goes on strike lightly. The staff at the museum, who were out for a whole week last week because of inactivity and bringing an end to that dispute, um, they did not take that option lightly. But there was no mention, of course, of that in the First Minister's speech. However, I hope that the leader of the Conservative Party will join with the First Minister and the leader of the Labour Party in agreeing to oppose the trade union bill at Westminster. And I'll most certainly give way, for, give way to her to just now if she wants to confirm that. Absolutely no chance. Didn't think so. Um, but I hope we in this chamber will put aside our differences to defeat what is simply an offensive, bigoted, politically sectarian and nasty piece of legislation. And I will work and we will work with anyone who is serious about opposing this bill and preventing its implementation across the UK. And can I commend the government for agreeing, to, uh, agreeing with us to end the charging of employment tribunal fees? That is a very welcome announcement. Finally, I'm pleased to see that two years after the government took over my lobbying Transparency Scotland bill, we now have le legislation coming forward, although I sense it is done with little enthusiasm. In recent cases involving Ineos, the government's relations with Qatar, You're in your last 30 seconds. Yep, tea in the park, and of course the First Minister's recent New York rendezvous with Mr Murdoch, and the moves by a number of political operators with influential contact lists into the public affairs sector shows why we need robust, a robust lobbying register that shines a light on our democracy. President officer, I look forward to discussing all of these issues in the weeks and months ahead. Thank you, Mr Findlay. The next four speakers, I'm afraid I'm going to have to cut to five minutes. That's Kevin Stewart, followed by James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, one of the things which I always do uh, during the course of these debates on a uh, programme for government is to look at exactly how that programme is likely to affect the people of Aberdeen Central, who I represent. Uh, and Aberdeen, uh, at this moment in time, um, there is uh, some worry uh, about the uh, downturn uh, in uh, the oil and gas sector. And one of the th first things that the First Minister said today uh, is that the government will continue to support the oil and gas industry. And I'm really pleased that the, uh, our Energy Jobs Task Force uh, has been extended uh, for a further six months. I also hope uh, that the government will continue uh, to lobby the UK government uh, to uh, ensure that we get an exploration tax credit 
uh, which I uh, am convinced uh, will lead uh, to more discoveries like the Kalein uh, discovery which was given the go-ahead uh, this week uh, and will continue uh, to ensure job security for people uh, in the oil and gas sector. The other things uh, which jump out at me uh, from this programme for government is the establishment of that £40 million growth fund for small and medium-sized enterprises. As I uh, went around my constituency during the course of recess, uh, I visited a number of businesses, including uh, Woe for You and Rosemount, thanks to the Federation uh, of Small Businesses. And what I've heard from folks um, is that there is often a difficulty uh, in getting finance from banks still uh, at this moment in time. And I think that this uh, growth fund will be welcomed by businesses uh, in Aberdeen and throughout Scotland. One of the things which uh, I have asked for uh, is uh, for the government to look at housing. Um, Rent, private rented sector in Aberdeen is very, very expensive indeed. I'm pleased that the government has put money into social housing. The housing minister uh, opened Spencer Court in my constituency during the course of the summer. And also there has been money put into Craig Inch's uh, housing for key workers, which is extremely welcome. But I do think uh, that we need to look at rent controls. And I'm really pleased that the government has announced uh, that the bill... Uh, that they are bringing forward will include provisions uh, for rent controls and rent pressure areas. That will be very welcome indeed uh, in my constituency and beyond. One of the key statements for me that the First Minister made was we will do everything we can to mitigate welfare cuts and restore dignity to our social security system. And that dignity aspect I think is very important indeed, because what we have seen is Tory attacks on the most vulnerable and the poorest in our society, and that is an absolute disgrace as far as I'm concerned. But it's not only those folks and benefits. We have seen over the course of the summer, um, since George Osborne's budget, uh, an attack on the working poor of this country. Uh, the withdrawal of tax credits to 197,200 families in Scotland with a total of 346,000 children affected is absolutely shameful as far as I am concerned. And it is our children that are paying a particularly heavy price for this right-wing Tory ideology. And that, I'm afraid, um, is something uh, that we... Uh, are going to have to bear, but we will continue to fight against. The attainment fund, as many has, uh, have already spoken about, uh, will benefit Riverbank School in my constituency. Um, but if we are truly serious about uh, bridging the gulf in attainment, not only are we going to have to invest in education, we're going to have to change the way that we deal uh, with poverty in this country. Last 30 seconds. Thank you, President Officer. The only way that we can defeat that, um, in my opinion, President Officer, is for all powers over taxation and welfare to come to this Parliament to, so that we can ensure that our children have a brighter future. Thank you very much. Thank you, James Kelly, to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Five minutes, Mr Kelly. Right, thank you, Presiding Officer. The challenge for any government in bringing forward their programme is to promote economic growth, ensure that we have a strong and secure uh, health service, provide opportunities in education and ensure adequate local government funding so that we can protect communities. And whereas there are aspects of this programme that are welcome, uh, like the proposed introduction of rent controls, uh, I do submit that the approach of the SNP government undermines their ability to tackle some of the fundamental issues which we need to address in Scottish communities. It seems to me that the government have a problem at times in taking responsibility for some of their actions in devolved areas, so that when we see at the weekend that NHS Lanarkshire has a 
shortage in staff of unfilled positions of 130. You see, uh, you know, an official is put up uh, as a spokesman in response to that. Uh, and also, uh, in relation to Police uh, Scotland and some of the incidents that we've had over the summer, the government has not wanted to, to speak out on these issues. It's almost as if they wanted to separate it. Patrick Harvey's correct when he says the number of times that we've heard government ministers answer questions and say that's an operational matter. You know, how many times have you seen that at portfolio, at portfolio question time? It's almost as if, you know, I'm a government minister. You don't expect me to ask, answer questions about things that I've, I've got. No, I won't give way about things that I'm uh, responsible for. The other thing that I would submit is that over the, the course of this five-year period uh, in which the government have been in power, there's been too much emphasis uh, on the Constitution and not enough on the issues that are affecting people uh, in our local areas. And there's also been a tendency to blame others rather than take responsibility. And unfortunately, uh, that means that some of the fundamental issues uh, haven't been addressed. I mean, I agree with Kevin Stewart that when you look at the programme, you look at how it affects your constituency. And I look at how some of these issues are affecting my constituency. One of the issues that came up over the, the summer was a shortage of GPs in my constituency. And when you actually look at the figures, there were 5,000, uh, there was a, a GP practice to cover every 5,080 patients in 1999, but that's now gone up to uh, 5,668. So the, the position uh, has deteriorated by nearly uh, 600. And you wonder why has that happened? And again, you look at the figures, you look for the evidence, and you find that investment in GP funding has been cut by a billion pounds. Um, a billion pounds since 2006, and also there's been a 5% cut in support for uh, medical students. And it's no wonder, therefore, that we, we have a shortage uh, of GPs. No, I won't give way. Uh, and I think I, I agree with a lot of what Neil Finlay said about local government. Again, you see the impact of that uh, in our local areas. In South Lanarkshire Council, there's a £23 million shortfall in the budget. And that means that uh, cuts, cuts have been made in third sector grants and the cost of community alarms has doubled. If you look, if you look at it, yeah, I'll take an intervention. McKelvey. Maybe James Kelly would like to explain to this chamber why South Lanarkshire have to make such cuts to their budget. Maybe it's something to do with the fact that they have to pay out £72 million to the women they have consistently underpaid <laughs> over 20 years. The government's allocation to South Lanarkshire Council over a three-year period has been reduced by £80 million. And I would invite MSPs like Ms McKelvey, who spend much of their time criticising the local council, when it, comes, when it comes to the budget discussions in February, bring forward a proposal to properly fund local government. Your last 30 seconds, Mr Kelly. I would appeal to the government, time to take some responsibility. If you really want to deliver for Scotland, use the powers at your disposal to change people's lives and stand up for people throughout Scotland. Stuart Stevenson, followed by Jackson Carlow. Five minutes, gentlemen. Uh, Presiding officer, let me join others in congratulating uh, the First Minister and all the government team on an excellent uh, programme for a stronger Scotland, in particular uh, supporting uh, many of the social ills that there are in our society. Now, a number of particular things in uh, today's speech from the First Minister in the government's programme that I want to touch on. And let me start on food and drink. Uh, which is a very important issue for my constituency and for employment in my constituency. Uh, we are the home of uh, excellent beef and lamb, and of course, fishing is a very 
strong industry in the northeast of Scotland. We have seen oilseed rape move from a commodity simply to put nitrogen back in the soils to delivering first class extra virgin oilseed rape oil that is used in the best kitchens across these islands and beyond. We see that the North East of Scotland is becoming a centre for Europe uh, for garlic production. It's being exported to France. We are innovating, we're continuing uh, to improve. But there are challenges for the industry, and I hope uh, that in the support, particularly through funding for small and medium sized enterprises, that the government will look at how we can improve branding for small and medium-sized enterprises in the food and drink industry. Some of the recent troubles that there have been in the fish processing industry in my constituency are based on an inability of even quite large firms to control their own destiny to an adequate extent. They don't own the brands. They're doing work for others on short-term contracts. And when the contract moves, that can have devastating effects. They also don't control the sources of supply of the raw material uh, for many of the products that they produce. And I'd like to think that we can see the government giving support through the enterprise agencies uh, to companies to develop branding and to develop more robust uh, channels of supply of raw materials. We produce some of the best food and drink in the world, but we can do more and we need more support. The government has also said it's going to look at the planning system, and that can touch on the subject of food and drink as well. Because when we grant planning consent, be it local government level or by the government, we are actually granting a privilege to commercial companies that apply for planning consent. And in exchange for that planning consent, we perhaps should be more ambitious in what we seek to get in return. And in relation to planning consents for supermarkets, which are heavily controlling the food and drink sector, we should perhaps look at whether we can have planning consent conditions as part of national policy implemented by local councils and elsewhere that require local sourcing. Now, under European law, that's likely to mean within Europe. But equally, we can say it must be from small and medium-sized enterprises, creating the opportunity for these companies to grow through the operation of the planning system, perhaps in a slightly different way. Let me finally, uh, presiding officer, uh, talk on the subject of digital infrastructure, which the A Stronger Scotland uh, document uh, talks about uh, to some degree. Um, our week away over recess was in Plotton. It was an absolute delight. We had six megabit uh, broadband in Plotton. Uh, it was a, a town with an airport and a railway station. These are three things I don't have at home. Uh, we even had 2G phone signal, which I don't have at home. The UK government, of course, in its programme for new masts and new coverage for phones has not done terribly well. Not a single new mast in Scotland. I hope that uh, the ed excellent results we're seeing in delivering better broadband across the Highlands become to a point of near universality. For those of us like myself who cannot be connected uh, because of the line between me and the exchange uh, to superfast broadband, I hope that we'll see some priority given to the development and implementation of solutions for rural dwellers such as ourselves on exchange-only lines. We're making terrific progress. We're ahead of where we might have expected to be been some time ago. Presiding officer, it's an excellent programme. I commend it to everyone here in the Parliament. Thank you, Mr. Jackson Carlo. Then finally, Cabinet Secretary under Constance, five minutes, Jackson Carlo. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. It, it's been mentioned a few times this afternoon that this is a government that's been going on eight to nine years. That's longer than the wartime coalition of Asquith and Lloyd George, or the administrations of Macdonald or Baldwin, or the national government that followed it. It's longer than Chamberlain's administration, or the coalition that saw us through the Second World War. It's longer than the great reforming administration of Clement Attlee. It's longer than Harold Wilson's government. It's longer than Edward Heath's government. In fact, only the administrations embarked upon in the 50s by Churchill, by Thatcher, 
and by Blair lasted longer. And yet, we are told that this is a government that has laid the foundations for the coming decade and set out a bold vision for the next 10 years. Is this a government whose performance is matched either by its rhetoric or its longevity? Yes, some will say. And in the speeches of Linda Fabiani, Mark MacDonald, Fiona MacLeod, Rob Gibson, Kevin Stewart and Stuart Stevenson, we saw the evidence of that 600-year-old monk that you can fool some of the people all of the time. You can even at the moment, it seems in electoral terms, feel, fool most of the people some of the time. But this government will not fool all of the people all of the time. And in its record on education, on policing and increasingly on health, it is an administration that is failing Scotland and failing the very services which were dissolved to this parliament. And I'm going to talk specifically about health. And what wasn't in the programme the First Minister announced this afternoon? On Thursday, the Advocate General of the European Court of Justice will give his opinion on minimum unit pricing. I won't go any further, Presiding Officer, other than to say that I hope Very this wise. government will come to the Chamber immediately to tell us how it intends to respond to that ruling. Secondly, before we went into recess, the government appointed an emergency team to restore credibility at the new Queen Elizabeth Hospital. We don't know who's on that team. We don't know what it's done, we don't know what its remit is, we don't know what its recommendations are, we don't know what improvements have been implemented as a result. I hope that the Scottish Government will come to the Chamber urgently and tell us exactly what has happened at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, because over the summer the performance of accident and emergency has continued to lag behind that of accident emergency units across the rest of Scotland. Thirdly, more, than, more people are employed in the health service today than in 2007, and I support and congratulate the Scottish Government on that. But today we learn that nursing and consultancy vacancies are up yet again. And each year we have a remedial programme from the Scottish Government about how they're going to address it, and each year we come back and nursing and consultancy vacancies have increased further and yet again. What is the Government's programme? It's not in this document to address that. This week, a, con a constituent came to me. He's a long-term survivor of prostate cancer. He's been going to the Victoria Hospital for his routine checks. He was told this time that the checking of cancer has been privatised and that he's now to go to Ross Hall in future. Now, I have no particular objection to the independent sector having these services contracted out. It was Weight Watchers before. Maybe it is now cancer services. But it goes against the claims of this Scottish Government that it was going to freeze out the independent sector and that there was no role for, role for it in the Scottish Health Service. Is it the case that it's now contracted out ca routine cancer check services? Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that? The answer is no, it hasn't. But of course, individual cases where they need to be seen urgently, if they have to use the independent sector for those individual cases rather than having to wait, then that's what will happen. But unlike your government down south, this government will never privatise the NHS. Yeah. But, that, Jackson, but that's just what you've done. This isn't an emergency case. This, is, this isn't an emergency case. This is his routine annual check has now been contracted out to Ross Hall and the independent sector. The Cabinet Secretary needs to check her facts. There's nothing in this programme about plans for the winter this year. We've gone to, through, through two relatively mild winters where the, the NHS has been under enormous pressure. I've looked through this programme. It's not addressed. Sixthly, the government says it's going to invest in primary care. We hope to do that. No, I, running out of time. Running out of time. I welcome, I welcome the increase of a further £41 million in the provision of health visitors. But this government has talked about an all-party consensual approach to health now for two years. The government's idea of an all-party consensus Order. is that everybody in this chamber agrees with what the SNP government says. Time is running out. If we are going to have an all-party consensus on health, then we need an all-party approach to it. And that is sadly lacking in the Scottish Government programme for health. Thank you, Mr Carlo. I now call Angela Constance to wind up the debate, Cabinet Secretary, until five. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. For one moment, I thought Jackson Carlaw was going to tell us that he was part of the national government during wartime. <laughs> Presiding Officer, in, in cognizance of, um, oh, to know, the old ones are the best, um, in cognizance of Patrick Harvey's uh, contribution 
and his appeal for education not to be used as a political football. I do want to start my remarks by making a, a considered effort in that regard. And I want to thank uh, Fiona McLeod uh, in her role as Acting Children's Minister for all the work she has done in relation to kinship care. We We will obviously say more on Thursday about how this government uh, will be supporting uh, the equalisation of funding between kinship carer allowances and foster care allowances. And I also want to welcome Aileen Campbell back uh, from our maternity leave. I also want to take this opportunity, although she's not at her seat, to welcome Kezia Dugdale to her, her new role. Um, I know that her commitment to look after children is genuine and I know that it's one that is shared uh, across this chamber. And I also recognise uh, her passion uh, for tackling uh, gender inequality. I don't agree with her in terms of introducing um, a special qualification for teachers to work with disadvantaged children in disadvantaged communities. And that's because, in the same way that I believe looked after children are all our bairns, I believe that for everyone in every part of the education system, that we all, at our heart, have a moral responsibility to Scotland's poorest children and to ensure that they get every chance to succeed in their education. Can I say to Ruth Davidson, I agree, more time should be spent in initial teacher education eh, on literacy and numeracy. That is something that the Education Committee and members have raised with me and something that I am pursuing eh, with eh, eh, the providers of initial teacher education obviously recognising that they are part of autonomous uh, higher education institutions. And if I can say to Liz Smith, I do agree in terms of delivering equity that that doesn't mean providing the same to all children. Some children need support more than others, certainly. Liz Smith. I thank the Cabinet Secretary uh, for these comments. And I did uh, praise the First Minister for delivering uh, a policy this afternoon that will ensure that the discrimination for kinship care is ended. Will uh, the Scottish Government do exactly the same thing for access to nursery provision, which discriminates on the birthday for that child? Cabinet Secretary. I think there's a lot of really important issues as we move forward with our ambition to deliver over a thousand hours of free early learning and childcare. And there are three things that we need to do, as well as increasing the hours, we need to maintain the quality but we also have to find ways to improve the flexibility. And as we move forward as a government, we will be laying out in more detail how we intend to meet those three very important principles. Increase the hours, maintain the quality, and increase the flexibility. Now, when it comes to Willie Rennie, Willie Rennie was the speaker that I uh, struggled to find most consensus with. But can I say to him that I looked very closely at the pupil premium? But the evidence of what happened south of the border just didn't back it up. Can I also say to him that I was particularly disappointed that he misrepresented and really tried to blister the debate around the draft national improvement framework. And perhaps uh, I can inform Chamber uh, of comments from Larry Flanagan, the General Secretary uh, of the EIS, who, commenting following the speech by the First Minister Nicola Sturgeon this afternoon, uh, Larry Flanagan said, the EIS is encouraged to see that the First Minister has been listening to the EIS and others and is not advocating a return to the failed high-stakes testing regime of the past, which the EIS would have opposed resolutely. The Scottish Government's intention to create a Scottish-designed bank of standardised tests to support teachers' professional judgment would appear to be designed to build on the ethos of curriculum for excellence rather than undermining it. It is essential, however, that the mistakes of the past are not repeated and that safeguards are put in place to avoid the misuse of data generated through proposed assessment. So can I say to Mr Rennie, this is not about harking back to the past. This is about looking to the future and ensuring that every child and every community has every chance to succeed. 
And while we know that nine out of 10 school leavers go into positive destinations, but I want our education system to work for the remaining one out of 10. And the purpose of the National Improvement Framework and other aspects of the programme for government is indeed to improve outcomes for children. And in that regard, we will always you be informed by the evidence because we are not, unlike some of our colleagues across the floor, interested in ideology. Presiding officer, the First Minister has outlined an ambitious programme for government that is building on the strong foundations laid in the last eight years. It's looking to the future, it acknowledges the challenges, and we will address the challenges from a position of strength and from a position of hope. Thank you. Thank you. This debate continues tomorrow. We now move to decision time. There are no decisions to be taken. Oh, we have a point of order. Mary Fee.